smack dab in the middle of Pennsylvania since a place they call Happy Valley. Rising out of that valley is a stadium where 110,000 people all wearing the same thing show that they are very serious about their football. Gridiron Traditions is built by the Home Depot. I'm from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, roughly 85 miles east of State College, where we even share the same 814 area code. So as someone who grew up in Penn State territory, trust me, I am more than qualified to set this scene for you. And actually, every single bit of the state that isn't within around 30 miles of Pittsburgh is Penn State territory, at least according to the college football fan map the New York Times crunched the numbers for in 2014. What that means is, in this state, you are surrounded by fans of Penn State, which plays on a campus that is surrounded by, eh, well, not much. It's difficult to get to Penn State because it's a true college town. It's not a whole lot around it. It is the show on a Saturday and for much of the Friday leading up to it. And it's so remote and so imposing that the airport is right next to it. It's almost like an airstrip. You land and the stadium is right there. Okay, fine. There are some things sort of around it if you go a few miles, like mountains, Mount Nittany for one. Nittany is probably a Native American word, maybe translating to single mountain. So that accounts for half of their team name. As for the Lions part, it didn't originate with the football team, but rather it was an invention of baseball player Harrison Joe Mason back in 1904 as a playful competitor to Princeton's Tiger. When he later wrote that it should be the school's mascot, we think he was picturing a mountain lion which did used to roam around this part of the state back in the late 1800s. But the first depictions were of an African lion because, well, the first student to throw in a lion suit in the 20s just brought the costume from the theater kids. It wasn't until 1939 when gymnastics coach Gene Whetstone donned a mountain lion version and brought some real athleticism to the mascot game that things started to resemble the lion you see today. Listen, I like Ugga. I like, you know, Florida Gators and the Stanford tree, but they're not ripping off one-arm push-ups. That tradition birthed another tradition because colleges sure love turning their myths into statues. The Nittany Lions Shrine was carved out of limestone in 1942, and since the 1960s, it has been guarded the night before Penn State's homecoming game to prevent any tomfoolery from rival fans. For example, Syracuse pranksters have managed to paint the lion orange a couple of times, so everyone in State College is trying to ensure that navy and white are the only colors prominently displayed on their turf. Those colors are core to Penn State's brand and have been for a long, long time, but not from the beginning. Nope. Penn State beat Oregon to the punch by about 100 years and some change and having pink and black uniforms in the 1880s. They changed it up because pink faded too easily, but with modern materials and the anything goes uniform landscape, why not roll them things back out today? After all, the basketball team's been mixing it up since 2014. Well, the football uniforms are probably the most consistent and unadorned in all of college sports. Their alternate uniforms simply bring back subtle elements of their past looks. Most notably, presenting the rare occasion the Nittany Lions might not be wearing their customary black cleats. I think in many ways it reflects the community in kind of a beautiful way. It's a blue collar area, you know, and it's an amazing area that I grew up in. There's just sort of something more stately about like, this is who we are and this is what we're gonna be. Until 2012, they had never worn player names on the back of their jerseys. The stated reason for adding them was to credit the players who stuck with the program in the wake of the NCAA sanctions imposed after revelations of coach Jerry Sandusky's child sexual abuse and the failure of many university figures, including Joe Paterno, to report them. They returned to the nameless look after just three seasons. College football traditions tend to be more about students than institutions. It was students who changed the name of the tent city that has popped up outside Beaver Stadium in the lead up to home games since 2005 from Paternoville to Nittanyville. And it was students who helped the candlelight vigil honoring victims of abuse. It was students Laura March and Stuart Shapiro who came up with the idea for a blue out game, which became an annual fundraiser for abuse prevention charities. The Penn State student section. 22,000 strong is routinely ranked among the best and loudest in the country. And they're all about themes. Chief amongst which is, of course, the whiteout. It all started with a simple question from then Director of Communications and Branding, Guido D'Elia in 2004. You think we can get them to wear one color? It took a huge on-campus marketing push, but they pulled it off and promptly lost to Purdue. 
but the atmosphere was incredible. So they ran it back the next year against Ohio State and they upset them, which turned the whiteout from a student thing into a whole stadium thing. They haven't won every whiteout game since, but they have won about 60%, which is no small feat considering the opponent is almost always ranked. We're all there for the same thing, but then you put on a shirt too to just signal to that guy like, hey, I know you're 75 years younger than me, but we're here for the same thing. It's one notch closer to being all on the same page. And it, it's kind of remarkable testament to like herding cats. And now it's not just the whiteout. Penn State goes hard on the variation. There's the stripe out game with its contrasting navy and white and the helmet stripe game where that contrast is limited to just the fans on the 50 yard line. They do smaller designs too, like the block S logo or the yellow ribbon for Thon the student-led initiative that culminates in a two-day dance marathon raising money to find a cure for childhood cancer. They are organized in pursuit of their goals. When they chant, they mean it. And they've been chanting it since 1976, when cheerleaders were figuring out how to keep fans more engaged. So they took the cadence of Ohio State's O-H-I-O and the first part of We Are SC and voila. We're Americans. We're not good at elaborate cheers. We can't do the British soccer fan thing of three verses and call and response. We're not there as a nation yet. We need several hundred years to get there. Right now, we are Penn State. If you can pull that off, you're better than like 95% of the fan bases in the nation. The fact that it's something I yell half of and you yell the other half of, I don't need to know who you voted for. I don't need to know what your tax bracket is. It's something that we can share for free and it, it embodies something. I mean, that's kind of a beautiful thing. Echoes of We Are at 100 plus decibels are only one of the unique audio visual experiences at Beaver Stadium. There's the marching band's floating lion switch up during the banger of a fight song, and also the drum major's running front flip, both of which have been staples for more than 50 years. But with all due respect to the band, the song most associated with game day in Happy Valley is Kern Craft 400 by Zombie Nation. I already know you're humming it in your head, which explains the appeal. Other arenas may have played it first, but especially after that 2005 whiteout win over the Buckeyes, during which the song was played nine times, you can't uncouple the 1999 German hit from a bunch of kids in PA jumping around. Beaver Stadium has the second highest capacity of any football stadium in America behind only Michigan Stadium. There's a lot of big sporting events and big concerts, but 100,000 people gathering in one place for an event, it is a rare thing in the history of humanity. Every time you go to a Penn State game, it's one of the largest gatherings of people on earth every year. It's gonna lose a few seats in an upcoming renovation, but that goes to show one reason college football is different from the pros. If an NFL team like Penn State was faced with not being able to host a playoff game because their stadium's pipes can't handle below freezing temperatures, they'd probably just build a new one with public funding. Sure, Penn State can foot the $700 million bill for upgrades, but that's just part of it. Here, where three quarter of a million attendees come out for seven home games every year, there's too much history, too many memories for too many people who wouldn't stand to see their cathedral torn down and we've already established how good they are at uniting for a common purpose. The ceremonies we associate with Penn State football were born here and evolved here after a necessary reckoning. Pro teams can hang banners, but a tangible connection to your school's story past is at the heart of college football fandom. It's about knowing you're in the only place you could ever belong. This episode of Gridiron Traditions is built by The Home Depot. How doers get more done.